All right, I'm out here on my porch today. We're going to be finishing chapter 19. There's a funny mismatch here where the world we're in is super cold and icy and um, dark, uh, but it's like 80 degrees today and really gorgeous. Um, I'll still, I'll pick the 80 degrees, I think. So just as a reminder of where we're at, Lyra has been talking to this professor who was also imprisoned by the bears up in Svalbard. This professor, she's learned, knew not only about Lord Asriel um, and Bjork Barnison and many of these characters that uh, Lyra has been in touch with throughout the book, um, but also is kind of in on what's going on. A big thing that's happening is that this character has told Lyra, uh, this professor character, that she really shouldn't talk about Lord Asriel. It's forbidden to talk about him. All right, so we're going to keep going with that. She, that's Lyra, she was nearly asleep when the bolts clattered and the door opened. Light spilled in, and she was on her feet at once, with Pantalaimon hidden swiftly in her pocket. As soon as the bear guard bent his head to lift the haunch of seal meat and throw it in, she was at his side, saying, Take me to Yofa Rackneson. You'll be in trouble if you don't. It's very urgent. Remember, Lyra has a plan about how to um, get, basically to save Yorick Burnison's life, because Yorick Burnison is coming back maybe to challenge uh, Yofa Rackneson and to rescue Lyra, and maybe also to get to Lord Asriel, too. So the bear guard dropped the meat from his jaws and looked up. It wasn't easy to read Bear's expressions, but he looked angry. It's about York Burnison, she said quickly. I know something about him, and the king needs to know now. Tell me what it is, and I'll pass the message on, said the bear. That wouldn't be right, not for someone else to know before the king does, she said. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be rude, but you see, it's the rule that the king has to know things first. Perhaps he was slow-witted. At any rate, he paused, and then threw his meat into the cell before saying, Very well, you come with me. The bear led her out into the open air, for which she was grateful. The fog had lifted, and there were stars glittering above the high-walled courtyard. The guard conferred with another bear, who came to speak to her. You cannot see Yofa Rackneson when you please, he said. You have to wait till he wants to see you. But this is urgent, what I've got to tell him, she said. It's about Yorick Burnison. I'm sure his majesty would want to know it. But all the same, I can't tell it to anyone else, don't you see? It wouldn't be polite. He'd be ever so cross if he knew that we hadn't been polite. That seemed to carry some weight, or else to mystify the bear enough to make him pause. Lyra was sure her interpretation of things was right. Yofa Rackneson was introducing so many new ways that none of the bears was certain yet how to behave, and she could exploit this uncertainty in order to get to Yofa. So that bear retreated to consult the bear above him. Before long, Lyra was ushered inside the palace again, uh, but inside the, inside the state quarters this time. It was no cleaner here, and in fact the air was even harder to breathe than in the cell, because of all the natural stinks that had been overlaid by a heavy layer of cloying perfume. She was made to wait in a corridor, and then in an anteroom, and outside a large door, when bears discussed and argued and scurried back and forth, and she had time to look around at the preposterous decoration. The walls were rich with glit plaster work, excuse me, gilt plaster work, some of which was already peeling off or crumbling with the damp, and the florid carpets were trodden with filth. Finally, the large door was opened from inside, a blaze of light from half a dozen chandeliers a crimson carpet, and more of that thick perfume hanging in the air, and the faces of a dozen or more bears, all gazing at her, none in armor, but each with some kind of decoration, a golden necklace, a headdress of purple feathers, a crimson sash. Curiously, the room was also occupied by birds, terns and squaws perched on the plaster cornice, and swooped low to snatch at bits of fish that had fallen off of one another's nest in the chandeliers. And on this dais, or sorry, and on a dais at the far end of the room, a mighty throne reared up high. It was made of granite for strength and massiveness, like so many other things in Yofer's palace. 
It was decorated with over-elaborate swags and festoons of gilt that looked like tinsel on a mountainside. Sitting on the throne was the biggest bear she had ever seen. Euphorachnison was even taller and bulkier than Yorick, and his face was much more mobile and expressive, uh, with a kind of humanness in it which she had never seen in Yorick's. When Yofer looked at her, she seemed to see a man looking out of his eyes, the sort of man she had met with Mrs. Coulter's, at Mrs. Coulter's house, a subtle politician used to power. He was wearing a heavy gold chain around his neck, with a gaudy jewel hanging from it, and his claws, a good six inches long, were each covered in gold leaf. The effect was one of enormous strength, and energy, and craft. He was quite big enough to carry that absurd over-decoration. On him it didn't look preposterous, it looked barbaric and magnificent. She quailed. Suddenly, her idea seemed too feeble for words. But she moved a little closer, because she too had to, or sorry, because she had to, and then she saw that Yofer was holding something on his knee, as a human might let a cat sit there, or perhaps a daemon. It was a big stuffed doll, a mannequin with a vacant, stupid human face. It was dressed as Mrs. Coulter would dress, and it had sort of a rough resemblance to her. He was pretending he had a daemon. Then she knew she was safe. Just remember that Yofor, who's the king of the bears right now, York was maybe going to be the king of the bears. He had royal blood, but... Um, you know, did sort of the terrible thing that he did, and now Yofer is the king. Yofer is kind of trying to become like a person once a day month. Lyra moved up close to the throne and bowed very low, with Pantalaimon keeping quiet and still in her pocket. Our greetings to you, great king, she said quietly, or I mean my greetings, not his. Not whose, he said and his voice was lighter than she had thought it would be, but full of expressive tones and subtleties. When he spoke, he waved his paw in front of his mouth to dislodge the flies that had clustered there. Yorick Burnison's, your majesty, she said. I've got something very important and secret to tell you, but I think I ought to tell you in private, really. Something about Yorick Burnison? She came close to him, stepping carefully over the bird-spattered floor, and brushed away the flies buzzing at her face. Something about daemons, she said so that only he could hear. His expression changed. She couldn't read what it was saying, but there was no doubt that he was powerfully interested. Suddenly, he lumbered forward off his throne, making her skip aside, and roared in order to the other bears. Roared in order to the other bears. They all bowed their heads and backed towards the door. The birds, which had risen in a flurry at his roar, squawked and swooped around overhead before settling in their nests. When the throne room was empty, but for Yora, Yofa Rackneson, and Lyra, he turned to her eagerly. Well, he said, tell me who you are. What is this about daemons? I am a daemon, your majesty, she said. He stopped still. Whose? he said. Yorick Burnison's, was her answer. It was the most dangerous lie she had ever told. She could see quite clearly that only his astonishment prevented him from killing her at once. She went on. Please, your majesty, let me tell you all about it first before you harm me. I've come here at my own risk, as you can see, and there's nothing I've got that could hurt you. In fact, I want to help you. That's why I've come. York Burnison was the first bear to ever get a daemon, but it should have been you. I would much rather be your daemon than his. That's why I came here. How? he said breathlessly. How has a bear got a daemon? And why him? And how are you so far from him? The flies left his mouth like tiny words. That's easy. I can go far from him because I'm like a witch's daemon. You know how they can go hundreds of miles from their humans? It's like that. As far as how he got me, it was at Bulvanger. You've probably heard of Bulvanger because Mrs. Coulter must have told you all about it. But she probably didn't tell you everything that was going on there. Cutting, he said. Yes, cutting. That's part of it, intercision between a person and their daemon. But they're doing all kinds of other things, too, like mating, making artificial daemons and experimenting on animals. When York Burnison heard about that, he offered himself for an experiment to see if they could make a daemon for him. And they did. 
it was me. My name is Lyra. Just like when people have daemons, they're animal form, so when a bear has a daemon, it'll be human. And I'm his daemon. I can see into his mind and know exactly what he's doing and where he is, and... Where is he now? On Svalbard. He's coming this way as fast as he can. Why? What does he want? He must be mad. We'll tear him to pieces. He wants me. He's coming back to get me. But I don't want to be his daemon, Yofa Rackneson. I want to be yours. Because once they saw how powerful a bear was with a daemon, the people at Bobanger decided not to do that experiment ever again. York Burnison was going to be the only bear who ever had a daemon. And with me helping him, he could have led all the bears against you. That's why he's coming to Svalbard for him. The bear king roared in anger. He roared so loudly that the crystal in the chandeliers tinkled. And every bird in the great room shrieked, and Lyra's ears rang. But... She was equal to the task. That's why I love you best, she said to Yofa Rackneson, because you're passionate and strong as well as clever. And I just had to leave him and come and tell you, because I don't want him ruling the bears. It ought to be you. And there is a way of taking me away from him and making me your daemon, but you wouldn't know it was what it was unless I told you. And you might do the usual thing about fighting bears... Uh, like him that have been outcast. I mean, not fight him properly, but kill him with fire hurlers or something. And if he did that, I'd just go out like a light with him, and I'd die too. But you, how can... I can become your daemon, she said, but only if you defeat York Burnison in single combat, the way it's supposed to be between royal-blooded bears. Then his strength will flow into you, and my mind will flow into yours, and we'll be like one person thinking each other's thoughts, and you can send me miles away to spy for you, or keep me here and be by your side, whichever you like. And I'd help you lead the bears to capture Wolvanger, and make them create more daemons for your favorite bears. Or, if you'd rather me be the only one, that's okay too. We could destroy Wolvanger forever. We could do anything we want. You for Rackneson, you and me, together. And all that time, she was holding Pantalaimon in her pocket, with a trembling hand and he was keeping as still as he could in the smallest mouth's form he had ever assumed. So just to kind of make sure, she's telling a lie right now. She's telling a story about something that's not actually true in order to make sure that the king doesn't just kill Yorick Furnison. So this king, Yorick Arachnison, would just kill Yorick Furnison unless there was a reason not to. And Lyra's trying to give him that reason. But it's a risky lie. Yofa Rackneson, the king bear, was pacing up and down with an air of explosive excitement. Single combat, he was saying. Me? I must fight York Burnison? Impossible. He is an outcast. How can that be? How can I fight him? Is that the only way? It's the only way, said Lyra, wishing it were not, because Yofa Rackneson seemed kind of bigger and more fierce every minute. Dearly as she loved York, and as strong as her faith was in him, she couldn't really believe that he would ever beat this giant among giant bears. But it was the only hope they had. Being mown down from a distance by fire hurlers was no hope at all. Suddenly, Yofa Rackneson turned. Prove it. Prove you're his daemon. All right, she said. I can do that easy. I can find out anything you want to know that no one else does. Something that only a daemon would be able to find out. Tell me what was the first creature I killed. I'll have to go in a room by myself to do it, she said. When I'm your daemon, I'll be able to show you how to do it. But until then, it's got to be private. There is an anteroom behind this one. Go into that and come out when you know the answer. Lyra opened the door and found herself in a room lit by one torch. And empty but for a cabinet of mahogany containing some tarnished silver ornaments. She took out the alethiometer and asked, Where is Yorick now? Four hours away and hurrying ever faster, was the answer. How can I tell him what I've done? You must trust him, was the answer. She thought anxiously about how tired he would be, but then she reflected that it was not uh, doing what the alethiometer that she was not doing what the alethiometer had just told her to do. She wasn't trusting him. She put that thought aside and asked the question Yo for Rackneson wanted answered. What was the first creature he had killed? The answer came Yofer's own father. She asked further and learned that Yofer had been alone on the ice as a young bear on his first hunting expedition and had come across a solitary bear. They had quarreled and fought, and Yofer had killed him. Then, this in itself would have been a crime, but it was worse than a simple murder. 
for Yofer later learned that the other bear had been his own father. You guys remember the myth of Oedipus? It's a lot like that. Bears were brought up by their mothers and seldom saw their fathers. Naturally, Yofer concealed the truth of what he had done. No one knew about it but Yofer himself, and now Lyra knew as well. She put the alethiometer away and wondered how to tell him about it. Flatter him, whispered Pantalaimon. That's all he wants. So Lyra opened the door and found Yofer Rackneson waiting for her with an expression of triumph, slyness, apprehension, and greed. Well? She knelt down in front of him and bowed her head to touch his left forepaw, the stronger. For all bearers were left-handed. I beg your pardon, Yofer Rackneson, she said. I didn't know you were so strong and great. What's this? Answer my question. The first creature you killed was your own father. I think you're a new god, Yofer Rackneson. That's what you must be. Only a god would have the strength to do that. You know. You can see. Yes. Like I told you, I'm a daemon. Tell me one more thing. What did the Lady Culture promise me when she was here? Once again, Lyra went into the empty room and consulted the alethiometer before returning with the answer. She promised that she'd get the Magisterium in Geneva to agree that you could be baptized as a Christian, even though you hadn't got a dame on them. Well, I'm afraid that she hasn't done that, you have Arachnison, and quite honestly, I don't think that she'd ever agree if you didn't have a dame on. I think she knew that, and she was telling you the truth, and she wasn't telling you the truth. But, in any case, when you've got me as your daemon, you could be baptized if you wanted to, because no one could argue then. You could demand it, and they wouldn't be able to turn you down. Yes, true, that's what she said. True every word. And she has deceived me. I trusted her. But she deceived me? Yes, she did. But it doesn't matter anymore. Excuse me, Ofer Rackneson, I hope you won't mind me telling you, but York Burneson's only four hours away right now. And maybe you better tell your guard bears not to attack him as they normally would, if you're going to fight him for me. He'll have to be allowed to come into the palace. Yes. And maybe when he comes, I better pretend I still belong to him, and say I got lost or something. He won't know. I'll pretend. Are you going to tell the other bears about me being York's daemon, and belonging to you when you beat him? I don't know. What do you think I should do? I don't think you better mention it yet, Yofer. Once we're together, you and me, we can think about what's best to do and decide then. What you need to do right now is explain to all the other bears that you're going to let Yorick fight you like a proper bear, even though he's an outcast, because they won't understand, and we got to find a reason for that. I mean, they'll do what you tell them to do anyway, but if they see a reason for it, they'll admire you even more. Yes, then what should we tell them? Tell them... Tell them that to make your kingdom completely secure, you've called Yorick Burnison here yourself to fight him and the winner will rule the bears forever. See, if you make it look like your idea that he's coming, and not his, they'll be really impressed. They'll think that you're able to call him from far away. They'll think you can do anything. Yes. The great king bear was helpless. Lyra found her power over him almost intoxicating. And if Pantalaimon hadn't nipped her hand sharply to remind her of the danger that they were all in, she might have lost all her sense of proportion. But she came to herself and stepped modestly back to watch and wait as the bears, under Yofer's excited direction, prepared the combat ground for Yorick Burnison. And meanwhile, Yorick, knowing nothing about it, was hurrying ever closer toward what she wished she could tell him was a fight for his life. All right. Chapter 20 is called Mortal Combat. That's where we'll pick up tomorrow. See you then.